Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 15, titled Father Philo and Mother Sophia. So, uh, Manju Gosha means the gentle voice. Gosha means voice or sound. Manju means gentle. And they say Manju Gosha has a gentle voice because he is already a Buddha. And so his voice, uh, when he teaches, uh, people hear it as if it's coming from their own mind. So it can be very gentle. Because as a Buddha, he is merged with all the minds of all the beings, supposedly. And he's said to be a bodhisattva also, Manjushri, because when he, before he became a Buddha, he, um, he made a vow that when I'm a Buddha, I want to be a bodhisattva in all the worlds where the Buddhas, any Buddhas are teaching. Because the Buddhists from ancient time had a very sci-fi vision of multiple humanoid planets and, and heavenly realms, what they call triple universes, a universe of heaven, heaven, or human plane, human and animal plane, and then the lower realms. And um, so they, they, they feel that someone becomes a Buddha, they manifest in all many different worlds at the same time. And there are certain Buddhist sutras, which shockingly and very sci-fi-like, uh, such as the Lotus Sutra, and especially with what's called the Gandavyuha, the, the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is translated in English from Chinese called the Flower Garland, Flower Ornament Sutra, uh, where uh, at the beginning of the sutra, people come from many other universes to listen to the Buddha's teaching in India, the historic Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching in India. And they kind of have a parking problem <laughs> because they come in gigantic, like, like uh, skyscraper buildings which are made of interwoven flower petals and have many balustrades and balconies, but they're said to be hundreds of stories high. And all the bodhisattvas and, and people are standing on all these things and they sort of fly in on these things. And then somebody has to park them. <laughs> There's a bodhisattva called the Kasha Garba, which means the essence of space. I think he, he stacks them up like a three-dimensional chess board type thing. And uh, <clears throat> so, so the Manjushri is a Buddha, lives, you know, appears as a Buddha in some universe, even now they say, but then everywhere that there was a Buddha or is a Buddha, he appears as a Bodhisattva in order to be close to beings. And then his mantra is Om Ara Bhajana Di, his main mantra, his heart mantra, Om Ara Bhajana Di. And Ara Bhajana, Bhajana means to ripen or to cause to evolve, to cook literally. And ara is a contraction of sarva sattva, meaning all beings. And di means, di means genius or intelligence. D-H-I-H, D. So om ara bhajana di. That's his, and om is in the front of every mantra. So that's the special mantra. When we had a, Tara Toko used to stay with us, the Lama in the Amherst. Years ago, he was a professor for a while at Amherst. He didn't speak English, so I had to translate for him. And um, he, uh, he would recite that mantra all the time. And, and I asked him once, why are you always reciting Manjushri's mantras? He said, he would be saying, oh, Maravadana Di, Maravadana Di, like that. He said, well, because Americans need to be more intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm reciting this mantra of intelligence to try to like, stimulate people's in, in, innate genius, he used to say. And um, he was discouraged sometimes. But I won't tell that story right now. So, so, so His Holiness, uh, now maybe a personal story might be good to start. And um, my story with this book is that when I was, um, when I went back to university, to graduate school, and you know, I got through my coursework and this kind of thing and, lear and learned Sanskrit and Chinese, and then, um, and then uh, came to the thesis time. And in the thesis time, uh, my Japanese professor, 
wanted me to do a translation of Tsongkhapa's uh, Vipassana teaching in the Lamrim Chemo, in the great stages of the path to enlightenment, which is treating the Madhyamaka or the central, central way. I call them central way, by the way. I, call, I don't call it middle way. The middle way was the Buddha's middle way between asceticism and self-indulgence, you know, severe asceticism and self-indulgence. So then people transferred that to the word Madhyamaka and they call it middle way. But then a middle way philosopher, they're kind of stuck because nobody wants to say the middleists. <laughs> it just doesn't sound right. But Madhyama also means center. Like the Madhyama, Madhyama Nadi is the central channel, for example. Madhya Pradesh in India is the central state, you know. Madhya Desha, you know, means the central country, you know. So Madhya can be center or middle. And it's, it's easy to say centrist, the centrist philosophers. You know, they don't have to be, they can be in the center of the road, they don't have to be in the middle of the road, you know, all the time. But, you know, nobody else calls it centrist. They just say either the Sanskrit Madhyamaka or middle way thinkers or something like that. Because no one wants to say middleist. And I don't blame them. <laughs> I never wanted to say it either. So, uh, but that was anyway in the same topic of the centrist philosophy because the, the critical, you know, there are three levels of developing wisdom to realize the nature of reality, of learning, the level of learning, the level of critical reflection, like philosophical meditation, in that sense, like Descartes' meditation. And then there's one-pointed meditation. And without the previous two stages, the one-pointed meditation will not necessarily lead someone to understanding. It will just go off somewhere and land on some point, and then it will not, it, it has to be, it's like in Zen, even in Zen, where they, some way, the way some people teach Zen, they try to discourage critical thinking. But actually, you have to develop a great doubt in Zen. And, and uh, the koan, for example, the public case or the, the riddle-type case, is a way of developing tremendous doubt by critically thinking this way and that way and the other. And isn't that the thinking will get you completely to the understanding, but it brings you to the brink. It's necessary to bring you to the brink, even in Zen. And it's totally part of the Buddhist educational model, in fact. And um, so the Madhyamaka, or the centrist thought, is considered to be the indispensable prerequisite of the one-pointed meditation on reality itself, the discovery of self, which is the discovery of selflessness or emptiness which is not a meditation really in a way on emptiness or selflessness, that would just lead one to a nihilistic misunderstanding. It's a meditation on non-emptiness and a meditation on the self. It's an attempt to discover the self, to discover what is not empty, to discover what seems to resist analysis. It's actually what the one point of meditation is in. And then, and then emptiness is discovered by failing to find that thing that one thinks is there by seeing through it, by penetrating it type of idea. So, so, um, so that's, all, that's what I was going to do. I was going to translate it in the context of the meditation of vipassana, or critical insight, or what I call transcendent insight, uh, which is what the thlaktong, the, 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 the vipassana that's looking for selflessness by looking for the self and sustaining the inability to find that analysis resistant self. And uh, so I was happily heading off for India with, on a fellowship for a year to write my dissertation by translating that section, which is quite lengthy and very complicated. <clears throat> and um, my professor wanted me to do it, I think, because one great Japanese scholar, the late Gaijin Nagao, had, uh, who was a professor of Sanskrit in, in uh, Kyoto University in the past, and he had translated it into Japanese, which my professor was looking forward to having his help <laughs> himself. But when I got to New Jersey, my, my root teacher, the Venerable Geshe Wangjiao Dengele Dutsenimete, he said, oh, no, don't do that one. He said, do the Dange Lekshe Nimbo, this one, you know, the essence of true eloquence. And um, I said, uh, oh, well, I didn't prepare for that. I didn't you know, study it. And I haven't looked at it. He said, well, just never mind. You just do it. We'll take care of it. We'll, some people will help you. Just do that one. So then I happened to have a copy of it that His Holiness had given me when I was a monk, 
a little printing from Kalimpong and a little green done on Western paper. And so I happened to have that, and then I took it with me on the way to India. And I began to struggle with it in Spain, waiting for my visa, which was six months delayed. So I had six months in the horrible condition of being in Mallorca <laughs> for these six months while waiting to go to India during the time of the Bangladesh War, et cetera, because Indira Gandhi was annoyed with America and with Kissinger and Nixon and this and that. So she was holding up American scholars' visas. And, um, and we were, so we were stuck in this paradise waiting to go and sweat. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, I was, and I was stationed by the government in Chantiniketan near, near Calcutta where they were beheading people, the Naxalites. It was a really bad scene there at that time. And um, so we were eagerly waiting our visa to go and get beheaded. So. Anyway, I began to read the book in Tibetan and try to begin to do a draft of translating it. And I just, I just couldn't, you know, I, it was really difficult. It's a very difficult book. It's known as the Dzongkapa's Iron Bow, Chakshu, in, in some circles, meaning, you know, a kind of a bow no one can bend. It's very, very difficult. And when I told His Holiness and other people that I was translating that as my dissertation project and st doing a study of it, they all like fainted and they like, hey, what's the matter with you? You know, like, how are you presuming to do that? And I would just blame Geshe-la. I would say, well, he, <laughs> my teacher ordered me to do it. I, I don't know what to say, you know. And, um, and, uh, and so then they would kind of relent. And actually His Holiness said it was his favorite book of, of Tibetan philosophy, of, uh, of centrist philosophy, and that um, he, um, he then helped me by going over that volume, the, the edition that I had, and showing me all the mistakes, misprints, you know, that were in it that he, from his own copy, and then he assigned me Taratoko to teach me to, to read it, you know. And then I, was, I slowly worked on it, and then, but it took me uh, 12 years, actually, I had to work on it before I kind of got through it. Very complicated, because his sentences are very long and his thought is very subtle. And then the story that I found out about it, which is quite marvelous, which I tell in the introduction to the book, is that when he was writing, when, when Jada Muchi was writing the thing I was originally supposed to translate for my dissertation, which subsequently has been done by the very nice Elizabeth Knapper, um, uh, he was procrastinating about it, as Don Kappa was. He was like, it was around 1402, I think, that he wrote uh, Lemrim. And he was like, oh, my maybe I shouldn't bother with this. And then Manjushri appeared to him as off, uh, he was always seeing Manjushri in those days. And Manjushri said, what's your problem? What's the writer's block? What's going on, you know? And so Don Kappa said, well, you know, it's so complicated and so... Do I really, who's really ever going to read this? I mean, it's useless, you know. And, uh, and then, and then Manjushri scolded him very strongly, saying, how are you to know how many people are smart enough to, and you know, deep enough to really cope with this? And like, you definitely should do it. What is this? You know, you don't know what, who's going to read what. And then in the future, you don't know who's going to read it. So you get busy and you write that. And then uh, and give him a big scold. Manjushri used to scold him a lot. And, um, and then to encourage him, he somehow vouchsafed him a vision where Tsongkhapa saw in the sky, in the place he was working on the Lamrim, which I think was Retting Monastery, Atisha's uh, disciples founded monastery, Dromdomba's monastery. Um, he saw from where he was, his, his writing stu study he saw in the sky the 20 emptinesses written in golden letters. Silver, I'm sorry, silver letters, silver letters. So silver Sanskrit letters, the 20 emptinesses. But in Sanskrit, not Tibetan. So that was kind of cheery. He would get up in the morning, look out the sky, and see these silver letters out there of emptiness of everything. You know. So then he went ahead and he wrote that. And then it said in 1407, when he came back, he wrote this when he was writing his commentary on the Nagarjuna's great book called Wisdom, the, which people wrongly call the, the root verses, the Madhyamaka Karikas, the root verses on the Madhyamaka, which is just the subtitle. The title of the book is The Wisdom. Wisdom, it even says, you know, 
Pradhyā nāma mula madhyama kakārika. The mula madhyama kakārika is a subtitle, you know, like a descriptive title. And the main, it's just wisdom is what it's called. That book, and when he was doing that, the complexities in the first chapter where Nagarjuna is rejecting causation, which is a huge thing to do, showing the unworkability of ordinary causation, analyzing causation until it dissolves under analysis, you could say. Since as you know, since you're all Buddhist scholars, Buddha's great discovery was causation, and, the, but, and also the cessation of causes. You know, om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetun tisham tathagata hi abadat tisham chayo nirodo and then their cessation, you know. That, well, you know, the summary of, of the Buddha's teaching that, was his, that he discovered causation. Because causation of the relative world is very powerful because it gives one a way of gaining leverage over the events of the relative world and improving things that, ha that are good by creating good causes and and uh, reducing things that are evil and bad and painful by getting rid of negative causes. So that was great discovery. But of course, the final insight of the Buddha was nirvana, which is the cessation of causation, or the realization of you know an uncaused, you know, uncreated, you know, original condition and reality of things, which is uncaused and uncreated. You know, nirvana itself, you know, freedom as the nature of things, you know, the uncreated nature of things. Right? The deathless, as the Buddha called it. Right? You ready for that, Tom? <laughs> My old friend Tom is here. Tom Griffin. Actually, it was in your room that I had a weird former life recall in 1958. In your dorm room at Harvard, you and Teddy Holstrom. And I was watching the David Susskind show <laughs> on your TV, which you had one in that room. And it was a debate, philosophical kind of program, and I was very frustrated that I, I was shouting at the TV. <laughs> you guys, I guess, were trying to do your homework, or you were passed out sleeping, or you were partying. I don't know what you were doing. It was the spring of 58, you know. And, and uh, then I suddenly realized, oh, that must be like what it must be like when you're dead. You can't, you try to communicate to people, and they don't see you. You know, they can't, they can't, uh, it doesn't register, you know. That was in your dorm room. <laughs> 1958, how many years ago was that? Back away. Back away. <laughs> anyway, OK, I'm sorry to digress. A sign of age. You know. so, so, um, so then I did this, you know, and uh, it's just really great. And, and even the very first verse, you know, the first is reverence to the Guru Manju Gosha. And in this handout that, you know, that, uh, that Tashi did the whole handout, you can read the, the, as an appendix the introduction, the, the prologue, if you will, to the, my commentary on it, where I just, it's a commentary on who is Manjushri. And in that, I kind of talk about, uh, I, which I'm very pleased with, actually. One, say, I was really looking at this, this at, at supper, and I, I love this sentence. My editor at the Princeton Press hated it. And she was like, but then all of the scholars that, she, that they used as referees, they said, oh, you have to publish this book. But she really didn't like this. I, I say, first, the essence of true eloquence. In other words, I'm saying, what is the audience of this book? You know? He said, if the original author felt diffidence, here I'm referring to the Tsongkhapa story I just told you, about the work's usefulness in his times, with the very many great Tibetan scholars that were around him in Tsongkhapa's time in the early 15th century, during the time of the global renaissance that was generated also in Tibet, how much more should I be discouraged by the enormity of the task of making these insights available to a modern audience? Indeed, the question must be faced, just what is the audience of this book? So then I say, the essence of true eloquence is a work of philosophy. And hence, a communication to philosophers. Actually, at the time, I was still at Amherst College. And the, about two years after I got to Amherst College, the Department of Religion and Philosophy split. And there was then a religion department and philosophy department, although I didn't cause that to happen. <laughs> it was the personalities of the, some senior members. But then I did have a long problem with the chairman of the philosophy department, who became eventually a very good friend. But for a while, he was very freaked out because he had the idea in his mind that India, and therefore Tibet, could have no philosophy. 
that philosophy was only a Western thing, and it was all theology in India and Tibet, and it wasn't like critical reason. And then once I, once I, and Amherst is a funny little college where every faculty member creating a new course presents that new course, and it has to be read by an entire faculty meeting, and all faculty meetings are mandatory for all the faculty unless you're on leave. So 150 people, it's more faculty, it's more college, but still 150 people would vet everybody's course. So when I wrote a course, a text, a description of a course on Indian philosophy, this chairman got up and said, there's no Indian philosophy. It's just bullshit, he said. He was other people, you know, talking faculty meeting. It's just bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> it's quite hard like that. So then I said to him, and then people were sure that I was doomed in that college, but actually he ended up, when he read this book, he had to eat his words, actually. But at the time he said that, so I said, well, I'm sorry, uh, Bill, but in Indian philosophy, anyway, what I call Indian philosophy, you can put bullshit forward as the premise and then give another reason for the bullshit. Or you could have a certain premise and use bullshit as the reason. But you cannot prove the premise of bullshit by continuously repeating bullshit. <laughs> At least in Indian philosophy. I'm not sure if that works in the West. <laughs> So then the, the, they passed my course, of course, and then he, everyone thought he was going to read <laughs> But we became great friends, actually. And when he read this, he says to me, Bob, having read your stuff, I learned a lot more about Indian philosophy than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> that was his way of recanting, you know. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, so yeah, so it's a work, oh yes, I was reading that. So a work of philosophy, yeah. And hence a communication to philosophers in the true sense of the title as lovers of wisdom whose wisdom is their love. But where are today's philosophers to be found? Too many have almost forgotten, this one I like. I like this sentence, it was outrageous to me at the time. <laughs> Too many have almost forgotten that science and technology, with capital S and T, are mere children, that ageless father Philo and mother Sophia still must worry about their notions and their adventures. That is, of the children, science and technology. Thus, neglecting the parents, these philosophers who think that you know, science and technology have taken over from philosophy, you know, and that philosophy is dead, you know, the great philosophers today, they all announce it's dead. You know, like Richard Rorty, male philosophy in the mirror of nature, metaphysics is over, Heidegger. Metaphysics means, doesn't mean woo-woo, you know, like aura reading or like going to Weiser's bookstore. Metaphysics means the philosophical branch that deals with the nature of reality. But philosophers have decided that's finished, there's no such thing, because we all know reality is matter, and scientists are measuring it all. And it's just mathematical measuring and you know, matter. And there's no philosophy anymore. Philosophy is dead. There's the literary criticism. There's going to art galleries and writing art criticism. There's like political commentary and irony. What, what was the name of Richard Rorty's second book after Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature? It's contingency, irony, and solidarity. That's right. Those are, that's all that's left for philosophers to do. They're kind of glorified like theater critics, you know, philosophers, because there's nothing to say about reality. Scientists have a hold of reality, you know. A.O. Wilson, the Ant-Man, consilience. You know, it's all we're going to, you know, we're going we're gonna to control all of reality. And we've finally discovered that all of you guys are nothing but a bunch of brain-deluded robots. Your brain makes you think you have a mind, and the soul even. Some really crazy ones think they have a soul. And, but it's really your brain. And you know, instead of this, I should have up here like a, an image of a brain with a medulla oblongata and these things, and I point to that, and then you feel, oh yeah, and then you feel your endorphins rising, and your, your serotonin is flowing, and you're all cool. Which, which is what they, they, they claim. But luckily, Thomas Nagel is still alive. You know, down here at NYU, he said that the attempt to explain reality as a function of material quanta is doomed to failure. 
it just can't ever work because it, it begins from the denial of what everybody knows, which is that they do have a mind and they do have a soul. You know? So anyway, I like that. I'm sorry, but I like that about Mother Sophia and Father Philo, you know, worrying about science and technology, going around destroying the world, thinking they know what's real. And, they, and even it's, it's so silly because I met Henry Stapp recently. Some those of you who are science bugs know who that is. Very famous quantum physicist. And I was so delighted. He gets up and announces, since 1927, mind came back, came roaring back. And, and most of my colleagues ever since and still now are in denial of it. Meaning that the quantum people, you know, Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, etc., they, this, the standard thing of quantum people is that they, they don't know what matter is. That matter disappears under analysis. And therefore, mind, the mind of the person is engaged, is a, part, is a force in nature. The observer is there. It's not outside looking at an objectivity, a material objectivity that is just purely measured and everybody can measure it with the same measure. And uh, even their own measurement is just brain activity. That's just a complete fantasy in, in the attempt to get away from the responsibility for your mind, actually, for trying to take care of your mind. Anyway, I was really pleased with that because he's a very distinguished quantum physicist. And he actually said, and other quantum physicists there said also, some non-quantum, non-particle physicists who were there were going like, oh, no, we don't do that, blah, blah, blah. And yes, he said, Einstein led a rebellion against that and tried to say, yes, there's a way in which we're going to connect classical, the classical and the post-classical physics. Uh, there'll be a way and we'll get electromagnetism to connect to gravity and blah, 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 and the, on the 11th dimension. All this completely cuckoo theology, basically. Untestable, empirically inaccessible mathematical theology, really, is what it is. Totally out of, and they're not trained as philosophers, and they don't know how to meditate, they don't have concentrate. And it's, uh, anyway, so. Thus neglecting the parents, these philosophers become enthralled by the willful children. Their philosophy becomes a mere handmaiden of science and is hard pressed even to cope with that rambunctious technology. They take comfort in assuming the role of technicians of language and other conceptual systems servicing the theoretical software of the empirical experimenters whose work they assume to be really important as directly affecting physical reality. They constantly proclaim the end of philosophy or the end of metaphysics and devote much care to the history of this now obsolete pursuit, or that meaning philosophy. In fact, metaphysical thought is still very much in charge of the prevalent worldview. It seems at an end only because it has become stuck on materialism, which is a metaphysical decision. It has conceded final, quote, objective, unquote, reality to the, quote, given data, unquote, of the senses. In short, it has become dogmatic, and like other dogmatisms before it, it has little patience with heresies. In particular, it has eviscerated itself by completely devaluing the power and importance of the mind, losing sight of the role the understanding plays in the actual construction of, quote, reality, unquote. It has therefore ruled out in principle its own power, the power of philosophy to transform life, either individual or social. So anyway, I go on and on with that, and I come up with the four presuppositions for Western philosophers that make them perhaps unreceptive to the topic of wisdom, of transcendent wisdom, of emptiness. And then the four presuppositions that make Buddhist practitioners intolerant of it, actually. So I don't only challenge the Westerners, I also get after the Buddhists. And uh, I have this for them. I like that. So you can read that yourself. OK. So now, where do we start with the actual text itself? We start with Manjushri. And I think I mentioned a little something about Manjushri. But you know, they're said to be the outer Manjushri is this being who is a Buddha and um, who pretends to be a bodhisattva to get beings to ask questions of any Buddha that they see. Wherever a Buddha is, Manjushri will go there and say, really, Do, would you mean that? What's the real meaning of that and this sort of thing? And, um, but the inner Manjushri actually is in every one of our minds. The inner Manjushri is the strange thing that the Buddha insisted that human beings have 
which, it, which he found that he had, having been a spoiled brat prince and then a completely self-involved ascetic torturing himself, having done, gone to those two extremes, and then come to a middle way in that case between two extremes, <laughs> a central way where he, he became a, you know, a, a sage, a muni. And uh, so he then just says that we have the ability to understand ourselves. That's a big shock. Do you, does anybody tell you you can fully understand yourself or the world? Where Did you hear that anywhere? I don't think so. People often ask me, why did you as a young boy um, get so interested in Buddhism? And after acknowledging that I was suffering from a case of adolescent megalomania, megalomaniacal omniscience, I say that I was annoyed by people saying on two directions that you can't understand yourself and you therefore have to depend on their authority. And the one is the religious direction where we are just these ignorant sinful beings and there's, there's a God that knows everything but doesn't, didn't decide to tell us about it and actually made us to be unable to understand it and just have blind faith. And then on the other side, the scientists, they're going to understand this piece and that piece of this and that function or thing, but any scientist who says, they, Eureka, I fully understand everything, of course, they, they kick them out. They give them some serotonin uptake inhibiting <laughs> drug. You calm them down because you're not allowed to understand. Only a deluded and insane person would understand the world. And whereas Buddha said, I do understand the world. Isn't that great? Although our English word understand even shows the backwardness of our culture in a way. Why should intuitive experience of the reality of something be called understanding? You're standing under it? What do you stand under? You stand under some sort of order from above, don't you? It's an authority thing, understanding. Oh yes, I understand, it's like meaning obey. It means like somehow someone tells you and you, oh, okay, yes, right, got it. But that's not understanding, that's just receiving obediently a formulation from authority, right? Understanding. In Sanskrit and Tibetan, therefore, and other things, the words for understanding are words from the verb, mostly are words from the verb to see or to go. And so that like when you understand something, you go into another world a world of, that is newly understood by you as something different from what you thought it was when you have a, an insight about it. We do have words like insight and things like that, which are great. Intuition we have. But, um, but still, understanding is a powerful word in our language, so we have to use it. But it has a, its etymology gives us a sort of clue about how dependent on authority we are. Whereas our inner manushri, inner, inner manjushri, is our own ability to understand for ourselves, to be critical of what we're told, to be even critical of what we think based on what we've heard, and to really grapple with things and, and investigate them critically and then understand them at the deepest level. And the deepest level of understanding, what is that? Like, it's experiential in a certain way. It's where the boundary between subject and object come, becomes fluid. You, in a way, you sort of really understand something by merging with it in a certain way. You know, like the great poet Basho, he said, if you want to write a poem about the pine tree, you have to become the pine tree, and then the pine tree will express its essence through you. You know, wonderful poetic idea. So, uh, the Buddha, of course, was from the point of view of some levels of philosophy, he was, you know, he, he, what he understood was a little bit unhelpful in the following sense. In the following sense, he said, oh, he said, profound, peaceful, sabshi turtle ursel dumaje, ursel turtle dumaje, you know, luminous, ursel, or, or transparent, actually. Profound, peaceful, transparent might be better than luminous. Um, un unelaborated and uncreated. 
like an elixir, like a deathless elixir, is this reality I have found, he says, he uses the word find, I have found, experienced, I think, in that sense. And then he said, but whoever I tell about it, they will not understand. So maybe, or they won't get it, literally. Maybe I shouldn't say understand now. I'm conscious about the word. They won't get it. So I'm going to not speak, and I'm going to stay in the, in the forest here. I'm going to stay alone in, the, in retreat. He said a word like that, in the, in the, at least in the Sanskrit and Tibetan traditions. That's what he said. <clears throat> 